Hi, I'm Craig Smith, a former New York Times correspondent and host of the podcast Eye on AI. I'm also a special government employee at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, and in this role, I'm serving as the host for NSCAI's podcast series on the Commission's work. This is the third of six episodes looking at the Commission's third quarter recommendations to Congress. This week, I speak to Steve Chen, an NSEAI Commissioner and Technical Supervisor of the Artificial Intelligence Group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Dr. Chen talked about the growing demand for AI solutions in space, from coordinating an increasing number of Earth-orbiting objects to protecting critical communication satellites from attack. I hope you find the conversation as fascinating as I did. Steve, can you start by introducing yourself, telling listeners how you got to NASA and how you got involved with AI for national security? Sure. So I'm Steve Chen, and I've spent most of my day job career working for NASA since going to graduate school at the University of Illinois, where I got a PhD in computer science and AI and machine learning. At NASA, I've worked on a wide range of problems relating to developing and deploying AI technologies for space. We plan a lot of NASA missions. So right now our software is being used to plan the EcoStress and OCO3 missions that are orbiting the Earth right now. EcoStress is studying the effects of increasing climate temperatures on the Earth's plant and biodiversity systems. And the OCO3 is the world's premier CO2 in greenhouse gas monitoring instrument to give us the most precise measurements on the changing percentages of greenhouse gases and how that's affecting our climate as well. The recommendations talk about developing a set of national domain-specific AI test beds to provide infrastructure and benchmarking for AI applications. Can you talk about some of the domains you envision that applying to? And would these be virtual cloud-based test beds that are reconfigurable or fixed systems? An excellent, an excellent question. One of the challenges in any technology area is to transition ideas from theory into practice. And the United States is in a dual-pronged competition. The first is to develop the best technology, and the second competition is to actually use that technology in those specific application areas. And there are many such application areas. We talked before about agriculture, transportation is another one, self-driving cars, mining is another one. People have talked about robotic autonomous mining. Space is another one, space exploration and space exploitation, you know, to create imagery. Biology is another one. What we would like to do is to accelerate both the development of technology and adoption of the technology. And one of the best ways to do that is to enable people to not have to keep replicating certain kinds of infrastructure. And so the DARPA Grand Challenge in autonomous driving brought together a lot of researchers, including non-traditional researchers, to look at particular problems and help jumpstart that program. And the ability to have these test beds. A lot of people don't know those grand challenges created these large test beds that people have been using since then for more than a decade. So they created a synthetic simulation of driving around in a particular environment, and then people went and used that for a while. Now, every major autonomous driving car effort has their own test bed. But before that, the challenge problem encouraged the development of that test bed. There could be comparable test beds in biology, in particular domains of biology, and almost every possible application that you could think of, we could develop a test bed that would help people to advance the state of the art in technology. And then that would also be a transition point from that test bed to the actual deployment and application of that technology, for example, in agriculture. And you asked a a fantastic question, which is, are those test beds virtual or physical? Well, they're trade-offs. If you have a virtual test bed, then it's very easy to spin up another 10 of them. So that's ideal. 
A great example of this is a few decades ago, some people were very passionate about robotic soccer. And they set a goal of by 2050, having a team of robots compete for the World Cup. And they're still quite a far ways off, but the progress they've made is amazing. And they set two tracks simultaneously. One is a simulation league track, and then the other is an actual robot track. And they use the Sony uh, Ibo robots actually as their baseline. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense. The advantage of the simulation track is many, many more people can compete because they can't afford the robots. They don't have a physical space. They cost a lot of money, particularly in developing nations. So there are hundreds of teams in the simulation league. And then there are more like scores of teams in the robot league. Actually, there's probably more now. My data is probably a little old, but there's fewer teams in the actual robot league because the care and feeding of the robots and the cost is quite significant. But both are very helpful. Even the actual robot league teams, they practice in the simulation because they can, through digital twinning of the tech, they can do thousands and thousands of matches on the time that you can only do 10 matches in the actual test bed. But the balance is the actual test bed is where the rubber meets the road. And so it's where you actually show that you can work in the real world. I would say we would have a lot of virtual test beds and a smaller number of actual test beds just because of the expense. The recommendations mention a program to curate, host, maintain, and make publicly accessible data sets to help drive research. They also mention a digital ecosystem for national security AI R&D. Would these be separate from the national AI resource that the commission has already recommended? Well, I think that those things are complementary, and they're all part of the global picture that The United States government has not modernized an infrastructure or policy at the same rate as, let's say, a technology company. And we have this joke, well, the saying within NASA, where we say, well, before you want AI, you want computer science. And before you want AI, you want IT. And the same is true in the national security domain. The bedrock on which the AI rests is computer science. And that means accurate data is available electronically. We have the ability to curate that data, to correct when there are problems in that data. And while most of the interest in AI recently has been machine learning, which I'll call data-driven AI, there's also model-driven AI, which is more advanced programming languages. And that kind of AI can also provide tremendous leverage. Both of those types of AI require data. The machine learning requires data because it needs to make generalizations and inferences and learn from correlations in that data. The model-based AI needs the data as well because that's what the models are acting on. They're saying, when I see this, that probably means this, and so I should do that. Everything requires the data, and what these multiple thrusts really are trying to do is to help as rapidly as possible move the government towards standardization of data accessibility of data in a, of course, responsible fashion, because we need to make sure that the data doesn't get to malicious actors. The commission recommends a DARPA grant challenge around third wave AI capabilities. Can you describe in greater detail what you envision that challenge would entail? And can you talk about what third wave AI is, actually? The idea behind challenge problems is similar to the test beds. They're very closely linked. So challenge problems actually bring together a disparate set of disciplines or sub-disciplines to solve a larger problem. And this has many benefits. The first benefit is you actually bring together these communities that may not talk to each other, You know, whether they're decision sciences, AI, human factors, and that's a huge benefit. The second thing is they actually help to create infrastructure. As I mentioned, the DARPA Grand Challenge actually created infrastructure for ranges and test beds for autonomous driving. For the DARPA Urban Grand Challenge, I supported the Caltech team, and they actually developed two test beds to go out and drive their cars at. The one was an abandoned hospital, and then the other one was actually a shopping mall when it was unoccupied. And these kinds of things actually help push the research forward. But the big thing about the grand challenges is they encourage people to think about problems that they might not think about. So they identify new bottlenecks that are then sort of like problems that the larger research community attacks. 
And so these grand challenges can help to bring together different communities to solve problems of national interest. And we have quite a few of these kinds of problems. The pandemic that we're in right now actually brings together a wide range of disciplines that AI is relevant to. Actually, a lot of the biotech community is already using advanced AI tools, in some cases, assisted by prior DARPA programs on synthetic biology to help develop treatments, evaluate treatments, work on vaccines. That foundational work to use AI to better understand the biological interactions has been actually quite amazing to see some of that work come to fruition. But when we bring it back to grand challenges, some of my favorite topics are things like integrated sensor webs for environmental monitoring. This is kind of a, a civil analog to problems of direct interest in national security. We now have thousands or millions of assets existing in the Internet of Things. And generally speaking, they are just pretty stupid. <laughs> they just gather data and they don't do anything with it. And the future is those elements in the Internet of Things processing what I call the data and turning it into knowledge. And the important thing about that, and this relates to edge computing, which is something that I'm sure your listeners have heard a lot about, you want to convert it to knowledge because sending knowledge around is much less expensive than sending data around. And then all those assets should work together to achieve some kind of particular goal. So at NASA, we've used that to monitor volcanoes, to track flooding. But some of the challenge problems that people have talked about is disaster response in a hurricane situation. How do you assimilate tens of thousands of data from smartphones? How do you assimilate satellite remote sensing data? How do you synthesize individual user reports? How do you deploy drones that know where to go so that you can map out the flooding? How can you actually have all that in a digital twin simulation so that you can practice it and understand where you should deploy, pre-position your assets, have sort of pre-canned plans for response? And so that's a great example of a challenge problem. Yeah. And third wave, what do you mean by third wave? I hear that a lot, third wave of AI. Is that unsupervised learning or is that this edge computing? Well, unfortunately, I think if you ask different people, you're going to get different answers for what the first wave was, the second wave. You know, just like if you go back to the Japanese national programs on first generation, second generation, third generation computing. But I can speak to sort of what the cutting edge is. So the cutting edge is machine learning in what we call in the wild. So right now, the applications that we've seen of machine learning are incredibly micromanaged and sort of address a very narrow range of problems. And when they try to apply them to more open-ended problems, such as the famous company hiring vetting of resumes, there are unintended consequences. And that's because Computers do what you program them to do, not what you actually want them to do. And that's both their strength and their weakness. And this includes even machine learning. So the next generation of AI means A, operating in more of what we call open world environments. B, it means model-based and data-based techniques working together as peers. So already we've seen this. Everything you see in explainable AI, everything you see on the physics of learning, that's trying to say, if you look at the data, sometimes our machine learning hypothesizes things that violate the laws of physics. So we want the machine learning to leverage all of this knowledge that we have in models, in physics models, to constrain what it learns so it can learn faster and more effectively. So using both models and data together is what I would call another one of the challenges. And then another one of the, what we call next galaxy challenges, is the multi-agent system. So there have been very few multi-agent systems where the agents have a significant amount of flexibility and it's gone well. And that's because there's just so many ways things can go. And if you look at human society, it has evolutionary feedback, but also we would like our AI systems to not suffer from some of the challenges of evolutionary feedback, which is evolution is an unbelievably inefficient way of making progress. People always say, well, why don't you have your rovers evolve and learn to survive on Mars? And I said, well, if you make that biology analogy, you'd have to send a few million rovers to Mars to get a few hundred to survive. And I don't think we have the budget for that. 
And so we want to find ways of having the AI be more robust and be more explainable without resorting to some brute force methods like evolution. Can you tell us about the proposed AI Catalyst initiative? I would say, again, this really gets back to the triangle that we were talking about earlier, which is government, industry, and academia. And so the idea behind the Catalyst Initiative is to encourage and sanction, if not direct, greater communications between the U.S. government and industry to make the best possible partnership between those two entities so that industry knows where the government wants to go and is working in that direction, that the two are really working together as partners with a shared long-term vision that incentivizes industry to take its significant resources in two ways. In one way, all of the commercial developments that are for, in many ways, a much larger marketplace and to understand how it can tweak those for national security applications. And second of all, to incentivize their long-term research and development budgets, which are incredibly large compared to even government entities nowadays. And also the industry has the ability to move more quickly on some of these topics, although that's another aspect of the United States government that we'd like to nudge them in a particular direction. We want really to bring industry in the government so that there are more equal partners walking down this road together as quickly as possible. And that's really the goal of the Catalyst Initiative. Reading the successive quarterly recommendations, I feel like there's a plethora of overlapping suggested initiatives. Does the commission have a Venn diagram or organizational chart that shows how all of these recommendations fit together? That's a great question. It's really hard to display it in something like a Venn diagram because there are so many dimensions of AI and national security. So one dimension is the different lines of effort. And the two lines that I've been most involved in are develop the technology and deploy the technology. And obviously those are heavily interacting because you need the information from the deployments to get back to know where the technology gaps are for the development of the new technology. And then there are even what we call technology push things where there's a technology so transformational that your traditional users can't immediately see how to use it. And so you really need it to sort of be almost championed by some rogue element. And so that's just one particular interaction between two of the lines of effort. But there are so many different aspects of the AI challenge, you know, in order to best champion AI forward. Another one of the lines of effort is workforce. Obviously, workforce applies to both the development of the technology, which is LOE1, and the deployment of the technology. We need the people developing the technology, the researchers, to understand better about the actual problems and to have that cross-fertilization. We also need the people deploying the technology to understand better some of the innovative new ideas that are coming across that are being developed right now. There is fantastic new developments in game theory that have tremendous applications to solve large scale logistics and resource allocation problems. And that's just one dimension, right, of workforce cross cutting across those other technical dimensions. Another one of the line of efforts is how the United States as a government, as a nation, interacts with other nations to help to form a global AI community. That's yet another dimension in another direction. Another one of the lines of effort has focused on AI hardware and how we can protect that and nurture in the United States our own US capability in some of those areas. It's very challenging to sort of get your arms around the whole thing. And I would just say that this is a many, many faceted problem. And each line of effort recognizes or identifies areas that need to be addressed and comes up with recommendations to address those. And then as you put it all together, there are multiple initiatives or recommendations, some of which overlap, some of which dovetail nicely. 
So is the idea that you recognize that not all of the recommendations will be implemented and so it's better to over-recommend than under-recommend? You know what I mean? Yeah, so I would say that there has been quite a bit of discussion in the commission on that, and I don't know that there's a consensus. I would say that there has certainly been an extremely large number of recommendations coming out of the commission, and some of the LOEs have been particularly prolific. I think that it's kind of like a Minsky Society of the Mind thing. The the lines of effort, I wouldn't say that there is one single overarching philosophy and the entire NSCAI is one cohesive block. I mean, really, the commissioners and the staffers as well, they're all I would say a coalition that has different views and there's quite a bit of diversity in thought in the NSCAI commissioners. And I think that's a strength, not a weakness, because that is what makes our country the amazing place that it is, that we have this diversity of thought, that we discuss it. There are some things that we put out there that I think there is complete consensus on. There are other things where I would say that there is a significant quorum, but there are some reservations And I think the language of the recommendations in the report reflects that. And I think that overall, our goal is to get the information out there to the decision makers to make our recommendations and do our best to communicate that so that they get adopted. But certainly we're not so naive to think that everything will just immediately get adopted. You're among the group of commissioners helping the U.S. find its way with AI for national security. As a senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, you're on the front lines of using AI for space applications, as you just said. What opportunities lie at the nexus of AI in space? And can you give examples of where you see AI holding the potential to unlock new national security capabilities in space or cyber domains? Sure. Let me uh, start with space. So space is a particularly challenging area to try and operate. And space is very important to our national security. Every time you pick up a smartphone, you're using the GPS constellation to navigate. There's an entire generation of Americans that don't know what it's like to really not know where you are. And this has implications not just for everyday life, but for national security. The United States military has not really been engaged in a conflict where it does not have air superiority since basically the middle of World War II. And space is very similar. So the high ground of space allows you to see what's going on and to know what your adversaries are doing. And it's very, very important to have access to space. And we have not really been in a true shooting war where space was contested. And it's quite possible that that could happen in the future. And just because the United States has built up so many capabilities in space, we have more to lose from space being denied to us, whether that's communications, whether that's location information. And space really needs AI. It needs AI for several reasons. First of all, A typical Earth orbiting satellite only really talks to the ground maybe six times a day. And the rest of the time, that satellite has to operate on its own. And you want it to operate intelligently so that it continues to provide these capabilities to the national security system while it's not communicating to the ground. Furthermore, Our adversaries know where our ground stations are. They know how we communicate to these satellites. And so they're going to try and deny communications to these satellites. So it's imperative that artificial intelligence enable us to continue to operate these space assets when they're contested. Also, the number of space assets is growing ridiculously. Both SpaceX, Starlink, and Amazon Kuipers plan thousands to tens of thousands of assets They're just at the cutting edge. Planet already is flying hundreds of spacecraft to observe the Earth every day. AI is needed to manage these. Planet automatically schedules the operations of these satellites using AI technology. And we can't have people operating tens of thousands of satellites individually. It's just not practical. So AI is essential to space because of the remoteness of the domain, the autonomy that's needed in the space domain to operate. You were referring to planet. What are you referring to there? 
So there's a company called Planet Laboratories, which actually has a number of people who spun off from NASA Ames. It's in the Bay Area, and they are at the cutting edge of flying very small spacecraft. They're Planet Doves, but they're what are called 3U spacecraft. They're about 30 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, so about the size of a shoebox. And there's more than 100 of these, and they image the majority of the land surface of the Earth, over 80% of that, every day at about four meters per pixel. And so that kind of knowledge and information has many purposes, business-wise, national security-wise, and so on. And the concern is traffic is literally satellites running into each other, or is the concern jamming of communication channels because you have too much data going back and forth? What's the concern when you get thousands of assets up there? Well, the number one concern is even in the normal operations at Planet, how do you control them? In other words, how do you tell which ones to image what parts of the Earth so you make sure that you get your full image of the Earth? And so there are a lot of constraints on it when the satellite is overflying the Earth. They don't just take pictures all the time because if they did, you'd have too much data to bring down and they don't have the power to do so. Because like I said, they're only shoebox sized. So they need to know when they should take the pictures, which direction they should take the pictures and when they should downlink the data. And that's a very careful orchestration of the operations of the satellites. And it's fundamentally a logistics problem. Just like, you know, how Walmart sends the different goods from the warehouses to the stores and then they sell. The same way Planet or NASA, for that matter, has to manage the spacecraft so that they're taking images of the critical areas. Maybe there's forest fires in California, so they need more imagery of California. Maybe there's flooding going on, or maybe there's a particular customer that's interested in what the strategic reserve is of a particular country in oil. There's a high-profile story that came out a little more than a year ago by Orbital Insight, which is a startup company in the space domain. And they showed that the People's Republic of China was understating their strategic oil reserve by over a factor of two times. And they were able to glean this information by satellite imagery where they study the shadows and they estimate the height of the top of the oil containers and do that on a national scale. So these are how you can produce all kinds of knowledge business activity knowledge, the most accurate estimates of industrial activity in southern China in the Shenzhen area are actually based on proxies for business activities such as cars and parking lots and people traveling around. This proliferation of commercial satellites, that's obviously going to be the norm in the future. So in national security, is the government's role or the national security community's role in managing communications in the space domain, not so much in placing assets or managing assets? I would say that it's changing fundamentally and will continue to change. 20 to 30 years ago, the national assets would be pretty much the only assets that would be relevant to this kind of enterprise, to trying to get this kind of information from space assets. And the commercial sector has completely exploded and grown at an unbelievable rate. And the reason is driven by business. So people, well, pre-pandemic at least, many business entities wanted to know measures of business activity. And there are many measures of business activity that you can get. Anything from seeing how many shifts a factory is working, counting the number of cars in Walmart parking lots. Believe it or not, there are people leveraging that business intelligence as we speak. Well, certainly pre-pandemic as it happened. And so that drives the marketplace. But it's inaccurate to say that the national assets are not still hugely important. They provide unique capabilities. And in the public, we don't know how many they are and what exactly their capabilities are because that information is not in the public domain. 
But certainly, it's very reasonable to assume that all national entities will be maintaining a significant capability in this area for two reasons. First of all, they might have cutting edge capabilities that just nobody knows about. And of course, you never want to tell people what your capabilities are because then it's easier to defeat them. And then second of all, they will want to have certain elements of these capabilities under their control. There's a reason why countries have standing armies instead of saying, we'll just hire a bunch of people if we need them. What kinds of capabilities, although, of course, you can't talk about specific, certainly classified capabilities, but what kinds of capabilities do nation states have? And we're really only talking about two or three countries. Is that right? Well, it's a typical long tail, right? So there's a small number of countries that have significant capability, and then there's a much larger number of countries that have a modest capability. And believe me, they all see that space is the future, so they're all trying to build up. So the most obvious capability is the ability to image the Earth's surface, because that has tremendous value to know just business intelligence, but also militarily, if you can see what people are moving around in the troops and everything. Then there's all different kinds of things besides literally pictures. There's pictures of different kinds, such as radar or thermal imaging that might allow you to see specific things that you couldn't see, you know, with the visible imagery, what the human eye can see. Then there's even signals information. What kind of communications are people doing? That's of tremendous value to the national security community as well. And so all of that together gives you tremendous information or knowledge of what's going on in the world. The ability now commercially that you can go and ask a company to image a site for you. If you have a, a few thousand dollars, you can ask one of these commercial entities to image your house and they'll give you a picture of your house that's less than one meter per pixel. It's about 40 centimeters per pixel. So, you know, you could actually pick out someone walking around and things like that, someone walking around your house. Now, the cost is coming down every day, but imagery is just sort of the tip of the iceberg. Another less obvious capability, at least to the average layman, is what's called PNT, precision navigation and timing. So that's the ability to know where you are at any point in time very accurately. That enables a lot of capabilities like guidance of weapons and things like that. GPS was originally designed to help people go around, and then they understood that they could allow other things to go around. And so one of the dimensions of national security in space is this deniability of communications. And presumably you'd focus on hardening our comms in space and developing attack vectors to disable the communications of our adversaries in space. Is that the primary focus of AI applications for national security in space? Well, the challenge is that in most of these domains, and space is really no different, offense is easier than defense. So it's far easier to attack somebody else's space infrastructure than to defend your own. So a balanced nation would actually develop both types of capabilities, and the defensive capabilities as much to deter your adversary as to actually defend your assets. Because in the extreme case, people start detonating nuclear warheads in space, which of course is forbidden. It's actually forbidden to militarize space, but that would be a tremendous challenge to defend against that. And the only publicly known methods to defend about that are replacements. And so many countries are interested in rapid launch in what's called responsive space. And that's the ability to launch new assets on demand into a wide range of orbital uh, configuration. Wow, that's fascinating. So the focus is on overwhelming firepower in space to disable adversaries' assets, or is it on scrambling their or jamming their communications with base stations? Well, well, jamming the communications of space assets from the ground is extremely hard. And the reason is it has to do with the reachability in physics. So if some country X, let's just pick a random country like Australia, is flying some satellite, they're most likely to communicate with that satellite when it's flying near Australia. Okay. And so their communication path is going to be from Australia to a satellite that's almost directly overhead. For us to get so much signal in to swamp their signal, that would be extremely challenging from a physics standpoint. 
But that's a great chance to let me segue into another topic that I think is extremely important to AI and national security, and that's the cyber domain. So space, like almost everything we do nowadays, is actually done by software operating across physical infrastructure. And often the most vulnerable aspect of that is attacking the cyber infrastructure that supports that asset. And so that would mean attacking the computers on the ground that are used to communicate and command that spacecraft and to operate that spacecraft and to get the data down, attacking the software installations that operate the ground communication stations, attacking the links to whatever distributed sites where we're trying to disseminate that information. Because if the satellite acquires the information and it can't get the data to the end users, it's useless. And it's actually much worse than that if you think of the more general problem of cyber warfare, because everything these days, all of our infrastructure, our power, our internet, obviously, our air traffic, everything is so reliant on cyber infrastructure that to attack and disrupt a nation's cyber infrastructure is a very inviting target. And I would say the primary reason why we haven't seen it thus far by a nation state actor is that it's a, a mutually assured destruction thing, right? If someone attacks us, then we might attack them. And that's why it's important to develop both types of capabilities, both offensive and defensive. And AI is absolutely essential to the cyber domain. And the reason why is for two reasons. First, the proliferation of bots, different software agents to do your bidding, it doesn't really have a physical cost. So, you know, if I want to build a thousand airplanes or a thousand drones, I have to build those drones physically and that costs money. Then I have to get them to the location. In the cyber domain, if I build a software bot, I can replicate 100,000 or a million of them by just forking off different shells. You know, Replicating them, they don't have a physical manifestation that costs money to build. And then how do I manage these hundreds of thousands of bots? I have to have AI to manage them. They have to be able to operate on their own because no human could manage all of them. And so the evolution of attack and defense in the cyber domain is different from the physical domain because of the rapidity of which we can change. If somebody defends a particular way, if I realize that, oh, well, they defended this way, but I think that leaves them vulnerable to this kind of attack. So now I can reprogram my 100,000 or a million bots or probably just generate a new million of them with that modification and then send them off. I don't need to fly airplanes or anything. And then I said, I was going to modify them. What if AI and machine learning is naturally evolving them to the changing cyber warfare? And all of these things, the response time for attack and defense in the cyber domain might be milliseconds. And so both space and cyber reflect what I would call the future is human on the loop, not human in the loop. So the human is involved, but at a higher level directing the strategic level, but a lot of the tactics and the evolution of the tactics is going to be automatic by AI. And that kind of cyber domain offense and defense is where the deniability of communications in space would play out. I mean, it would play out on the ground in the network. As you said, it would not be through signal interference or even physical attacks against satellites in space. That's just not feasible. Well, I would say that both are feasible. The question is, what's the easiest way to attack? So if a thief wants to break into your house and you put all these locks on the doors, but the windows are open, it's easier to go through the windows. And so that's kind of the exact analogy. They're probably going to try and attack all elements, but they're going to go at the easiest path. Yeah, yeah. I could go on and on on just this question. It's fascinating. Can you talk about the commission's recommendation that Congress create an AI Innovator Award program? And are there corollaries in the past? Absolutely. So the challenge that we have for what I would say the top flight AI innovators. So first, let me start by saying the United States has the most incredible research community in the world in artificial intelligence. We are the world's leader in this area. But 
What happens when you're the world's leader is everybody wants to knock you off of that perch. And one of the challenges that we have in our AI technology and research community is that the way the peer review and the proposaling process works is that a large percentage of the top talent's time is spent on administrative duties, writing proposals, monitoring proposals. And what we're trying to do is to identify key top talent and reduce their burden in this particular way. And so we want to identify the next generation of superstars and give them the freedom to focus more so on the actual technical research. And the particular AI Innovator Award program that we're advocating is patterned on the HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute program, and the National Institute of Health Pioneer Award. And these are incredibly successful programs. The HHMI program actually helped support 30 Nobel laureates. And there's been quite a bit of studies that have shown that the investigators of these awards have published high impact papers at a much higher rate than other similarly accomplished scientists. And that makes sense because they're freed from some of the overhead that the others have to suffer from. But even more importantly, it enables them to tackle more novel research topics. There is this trend in research, or rather this challenge in research, where the safe thing to do is to work on the conventional lines of research. That's more likely to get funded. You're going to be able to get published. That's the safe thing to do. What we want to do is we want to encourage more risky research, high risk, high reward, or, you know, jokingly, as the program managers I work with, low risk, high reward. <laughs> But in fact, we want to incentivize people to go where the intellectual, challenging, high reward topics are in order to enable the kinds of breakthroughs that will keep the United States at the top. And we also want to have a team-based program as well, because a lot of the most exciting work these days is no longer done within a single discipline or even a single sub-discipline. So it's at the interface between psychology and computer science, or it's the interface between biology and computer science and AI, or it's at the interface between botany and agriculture and AI. And this is also reflected by the NSF's awarding of certain centers that are focused on some, what I would call, application domains relating to AI. And so those two programs together, I think, have a tremendous ability to push forward the AI community. And I just want to pile on here and say a little bit about the synergy that has been a central theme at the NSCAI discussion. And that's the synergy between the government, industry, and academia. And I'm going to say that while we often list those three, it's a continuum. So I myself, even while working at JPL, have been involved in three outside ventures, startup companies. And so I've done sort of my stint in that area and seen a lot. And I've also had a faculty position for many decades at USC simultaneously while being at JPL. So I'm an example of straddling industry in the startup community, academia at USC, and the government as a federally funded research and development center at JPL. More typically, people would go sequentially through that. So Andrew Moore, who's a different commissioner, I first met him when he was a machine learning professor at Carnegie Mellon. Then he went to Google, then he went back to Carnegie Mellon, and now he's back at Google. We really need this continuing cross-fertilization of these communities because they all have something unique to bring to the table. And I want to highlight that with two stories from World War II. So in World War II, one of the most prominent isolationist was Charles Lindbergh, who, of course, became famous from flying across the Atlantic, right? He was very much an isolationist. But after the war broke out, he provided key information to the U.S. military on how to fly airplanes at longer distances with less fuel consumption. And that information was actually used by P-38 pilots to fly and intercept Admiral Yamamoto's airplane and shoot it down, arguably a very important turning point in the war, to take out one of the key leaders of the Japanese military. And they thought he was safe because you couldn't fly that far. So that's a great example of civil military partnership. And we need that kind of synergy and partnership. Even though we're not literally in a shooting war now, we are in a global competition and we need that kind of partnership. 
And I just want to clarify for listeners, the AI Innovator Award Program, we started out talking about AI's application to competition in space, but the Innovator Award Program applies across domains. It's not restricted to space or cyber. It's AI generally. Is that correct? Yes. Both the AI Innovator Award Program, which is designed to identify the future superstars, as well as the team awards, they are not specific to any particular discipline. They're specific to AI, and they would also likely be distributed across different domains of application of AI, such as AI in healthcare, AI in biology, AI in chemistry, AI in agriculture, because we feel that AI is an essential leverage to advance all of these areas that are incredibly important to our national ability for the good of the citizenry, as well as in this longer term competition. And just to sum up, I want to go back to the space thing. I mean, your line of effort isn't addressing the space domain specifically, but that is your expertise. Do you see the competition with potential adversaries like China moving aggressively into space? Or is it already, unbeknownst to the public, fairly aggressive to develop both offense and defensive systems? And as there's this proliferation of commercial assets in space, is it up to the nation states in which those commercial entities reside to protect them? In other words, does sovereignty now extend into space to cover assets of one country as opposed to another? Those are all very good questions. So first, let me make a statement. The NSCAI Commission has identified both space and cyber as essential domains where AI will play a critical role in national security. So I believe that that is established and really not under contention. The harder question is what to do about that and how much to do about that. And I, for one, uh, speaking as an individual commissioner, not for the entire commission, would advocate for a substantial investment to increase our capabilities in both the cyber and space arenas in AI. I would also argue that we need to ensure that those domains are actually considered at the same level as the traditional domains of air, land, and sea, because they are at least as important. And there are arguments that the cyber domain is now more important than the traditional domains of air, land, and sea, and even space, because it cuts across all of them. Now, your second question is really, what is the landscape and what are other actors doing? And we don't really have a huge amount of information as to what they're doing in the military domain. But I can tell you in the civil domain, China has moved out very aggressively to demonstrate their space capabilities. They had a rover on the moon. They're sending assets to Mars. They have indicated a plan to send humans to Earth orbit and beyond Earth orbit. And there is no clear differentiation between civil and military space in the Chinese efforts. So just as in other aspects of their efforts, they have a overarching ability for the Chinese military to arbitrarily take both commercial assets as well as civil applications, civil governmental applications without any restrictions. And so it's very different from the United States. There is every single possible bit of evidence that they are moving out extremely aggressively on this topic to develop more space capabilities and specifically more space AI capabilities. There's literally droves of papers that we see in the journals endlessly about automatic interpretation of remote sensing data using AI, automatic control of satellites, scheduling of satellites. You know, that's my specific specialty. So I see all these papers endlessly as a reviewer and they are extremely aggressively moving out in those areas. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Steve for his time. If you want to learn more about the National Security Commission on AI, visit their website at www.nscai.gov. And remember, the singularity may not be near. 
but AI is about to change your world, so pay attention.